Good morning and thank you for joining us today for this conversation on the IML Private Portfolio Fund. The idea of this session stems from many people being concerned with the heightened volatility in the market right now. This fund was incepted four years ago to address this very concern and designed to provide investors with an adequate return without needing to take on excessive risk at the wrong time. It combines IML's deep fundamental research with Tuan Lu's extensive market experience. We can proudly report that the fund is exceeding its objectives and has recently been announced as a finalist in the Financial Newswire SQM Research Fund Manager of the Year Awards in both the long short equities and emerging fund categories. Before we start, there will be questions, there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation, which you can enter in the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'd like you to like to introduce you to the fund's portfolio managers, managers Tuan Lu and Mark Whitaker, who are here to take you through the fund. Good morning, guys. Hey, good morning. Thanks, Gavin. Um, thanks for joining us on the Thursday morning, guys. Um, happy spring, by the way. Um, <laughs> So um, let, uh, can I please uh, have a quick introduction of my background? I've been with IML now five and a half years. In my previous life at Macquarie, I've been a uh, option market maker and a hedge fund manager as well. And uh, we've been tested throughout the GFC and now through COVID. So, uh, you know, as you can see between the, the three of us and I'm the guy in the middle, uh, we almost have uh, almost one year, one, one lifetime's worth of experience. So as the portfolio manager, um, I'm assumed the main responsibility for running the fund each day, managing the exposures, the risk management, the positioning and option management. Um, Anton helps with the high conviction uh, level of calls, particularly in the uh, large cap side. And Mark? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. I'm the, I'm the good looking guy on, on the screen there if you can't tell which one I am. But uh, look, I've been at IML for six years now. We're closely with Tuan for a, a big part of that five and a half years at time has been here. Uh, previously, uh, or prior to IML, having worked at Norfolk out of uh, New Zealand and Lazard Asset Management, uh, Asset, As uh, Asia Pacific as well. So a lot of years working in Aussie equities and, and really my role in the fund is to help funnel as many ideas as we can across the three buckets uh, to Twan, whether that be a you know, relative value, sort of high conviction value, valuation based ideas, whether that be event um, driven ideas or, or income based ideas as well. So. Yeah, really very happy to be part of the fund and, and working closely with Twan. That's been great. Um, so uh, as Gavin said, guys, the the, um, the basis for the fund is that we set up this fund a little bit over four years ago. The intention was to set a fund that can generate positive return across the market cycle without dependency on an ever rising market. We also want to pull our skills together in stock selection, in event, uh, in, in corporate events, and also income generation to derive that sort of uh, old school, if you like, multi-strategy approach. Um, so our objective is quite simple. We want to make between six to 10% net per annum. So internal targets probably 8% uh, to keep ahead of inflation while not being you know, um, forced to raise the leverage or the risk at the wrong time, particularly right now in this sort of volatile and uncertain market environment. So the fund um, aims to build a, def a defensive structure using you know, the core IML fundamental research, um, the high conviction ideas for large and small caps. Uh, the, part, the second part is very, very important, capital stability in uncertain market. And that means that, you know, in lower vol, um, you know, generating the returns at lower volatility, and particularly now with the downside capture being uh, lowered, much more lower than the market. And, uh, you know, even right now with cash rates starting to rise, um, income focus all the time, we want to pay the income with franking of, of the total return generated. So I just want to make it clear, this is not an income fund. So that means that we will only pay income out of the total return generated. Uh, in a tough year, perhaps we, we would probably reduce or not pay income uh, in the, in the um, attempt to recuperate the capital uh, base rather than having to pay at all time. So, you know, in order to be defensive and yet uh, opportunistic, you know, the fund has three diversified strategies, uh, relative value, uh, corporate events and income. And you can think of, you know, the three strategies as a toolbox that leverages our skill set, you know, to generate return across the market cycle. 
So what we do is we actively manage the fund sensitivity to the market movement. Um, it's better for better stability, particularly in volatile markets. Um, being an IML fund, and that means that we, um, in terms of our um, leverage, uh, is, is very, very conservative. We don't use any financial gearing. And uh, unlike um, you know, typical long short fund or market neutral funds, our shorting is mostly used for downside market risk management and not for speculative stock shorting. Um, with its three diversified strategies, um, um, Jake, can you go next? The, the fund aims to have you know, full, good flexibility across the uh, market cycle. Um, you can see over the last decade, you know, certain strategy will work well. Um, we don't know what's going to happen next, but we hope to have enough tools in our multi-strategy to cope with the changing environment. So as you can see, bullish market conditions help tend to help our high conviction calls um, and also the M&A corporate event trades. In neutral or range-bound markets like what we're experiencing right now, uh, that will help a lot of in terms of our high, uh, our, our high income or buy right investments because of the volatility uh, churning it, it every day. And of course, in bearish market conditions, you know, the fund's ability to short, uh, to short sell um, and defensive characteristics should mean that the fund will hold up better in a down market. Also, as you can remember from the GFC and now after the COVID um, outbreak, a lot of recapitalization trades, a capital raising trades are going through the market. And that is also a great um, generator of uh, return for the fund as well. So um, given where we are today with the, uh, the challenges of inflation, interest rate rises and the threat of recession, perhaps, we think that uh, the events trade, um, the volatility trade and the quality and value stock focus should work well this year. You know, portfolio construction for us across the three strategies um, is built around our stock selection, uh, corporate events trading, and income generation skills. So relative value currently makes up about a third of the fund, you know, with fundamental research ideas from both IML high conviction, large and small cap stocks. Um, events, um, you know, currently make up about 40% of, uh, of the book right now. You know, a lot of corporate activity opportunities still going through the market. You know, you've seen quite a lot of capital raisings, uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, indicative proposals like today, even Tyros being looked at. And, uh, you know, so in this space, uh, this builds on our research, our access to the deal pipeline, but also my previous experience at Macquarie as well. And lastly, the income strategy currently makes up the remaining a third of the portfolio. And this draws on our extensive experience in running the equity income fund at IML. To give you examples, um, you know, of what we actually do in each strategies, you know, relative value strategies um, invest in the same quality and value high conviction stocks as in our flagship funds at IML. You know, um, solid industrial companies with good balance sheet management. Uh, with um, dividend yield um, and, uh, you know, stocks that we follow over two decades, solid industrial names such as Amcor, Bramble, CSL and Telstra. Um, secondly, corporate events for us is about participating each day in the M&A and capital raising pipelines that you see every day. Uh, in M&A, we try to find the strategic value of the asset in the hands of the right holder such as the recent um, bid for Crown Resorts by Blackstone and the current bid for Oz Minerals uh, by BHP. Uh, in the mergers, we look for uh, to unlock the potential of the emerging companies like um, Tab Corp and the Lottery Corporation recently, where the sum of the parts um, are, are more, you know, potentially higher than the, the lock component in terms of the merge entity. In capital raising, uh, we subscribe and profit from select capital opportunities uh, with our analysts um, in terms of research. You know, recent examples, um, you've got Aristocrat, you've got Clean Away last month, you've got Transurban, uh, Steadfast, Orica. And uh, thirdly, you know, in a still pretty much low cash rate environment, our income strategy is still very, very important to retirees. You know, we aim to 
earn good sustainable dividend yield between four to seven percent from conservative companies like Medibank Private, and then supplement this income with option premium that we derive from the market because of the heightened volatility market environment right now, we can add as much as two to three percent uh, of additional income for every two months. So two to three percent of additional income for every two months. And this is a very, very powerful generator that differentiate us from uh, typical income funds out there. And the strategy also invest in select REITs, utilities, income securities such as um, Abacus Property, uh, Dexas Convenience Retail. These guys yield to pretty much four to seven percent of a very, very conservative asset base. So turning turn back to sort of um, you know positioning and exposure. You know when you look at a typical absolute return fund or market neutral fund, the hedge fund, if you, in other words, they use a lot of leverage in order to earn performance fees. Typically, you know 150 long, 150 percent short. Uh, we try to maintain very, very conservative gearing uh, gross and net exposure uh, for risk management. And for the last 24 months, you can see the chart shows our gross exposure in blue and uh, net exposure in red. And over the last 24 months, this is quite, quite consistent. You know, gross exposure is around 115, both long and short. And net exposure, you can see quite, quite um, static. Uh, over the last 24 months at around 40%. So due to this prudent positioning, you can see that you know, when the market comes down, we participate um, in terms of downside capture uh, is very, very defensive over the last 24 months. So what we've done here is we've charted the last, um, uh, all the days over the last 24 months where the market dropped more than one and a half percent and uh, for 38 days over the last little while. And over that period, the fund on average participated typically 27% of the market drop, 27%, so quite defensive. And this is very important from a, a retail client perspective. You know, you can watch the news and say, oh, the all odds down, you know, or the uh, 200 index down 2%. You know, or three percent. What uh, you know? How much of that loss have I been participating? At least with this fund, you know it's going to be always constrained and controlled in terms of that downside sort of capture. Uh, as a live example, yesterday, you know, the market got sold off um, on the back of um, worry about um, you know the rate rise and uh, recent rate rise on Tuesday. The market was down, I think, 1.4 percent. Uh, we were down about um, uh, 35 basis points. So only again 27 percent of that. So that's you know a very very and we keep a very very close eye on this every single day. Um, moving on to um, the important themes distinguishing and impacting the fund. Um, first is the capital raising cycle. You know over um, since um, 2021, uh, Australian companies have raised up to and block trades have been around 56 billion dollars. Uh, and primarily to take advantage of the current investor demand for assets or just to acquire other companies. You know, with, um, with uh, the analysts, with our, with our team of analysts, we selectively subscribe to some of these, uh, typically with uh, our, uh, the analyst recommendations, and then hedges out the underlying stock uh, in the market to lock in the discount. The second theme um, impacting the fund is, um, from my angle, is uh, mergers and acquisitions. You know, on the other side of corporate events, you know, the recent low interest rate environment, together with the investor appetite for COVID depressed assets, but high cash generators, have meant that the active M&A pipeline has swollen up to $135 billion uh, in, since 2021. You know, private equity, uh, industry funds, as well as corporates, have been very, very active acquirers. You know, at RML, uh, we're very lucky that many of our investments, um, I can probably think about uh, several, have been targeted by, uh, uh, by takeovers, you know, example like uh, Spark Infrastructure, uh, Osnet, Sydney Airport, API, um, Z Energy, Link, uh, Crown, okay. and Infomedia. So quite a lot have been targeted in MA transactions. So I think the good news here um, is that acquiring companies are seeing the same value and quality as we do. And the third, um, the third driver um, impacting the fund is obviously volatility. 
you know, in this world of instantaneous information, you know, stocks react very, very rapidly to news, uh, to ETF capital flows, to thematic rotations. You know, one day in, into energy, out of, um, out of cyclicals, next day, you know, into uh, resources uh, and out of uh, technology, for example. You know, if you look at this chart, the blue line um, shows the option volatility uh, in the markets, which has been consistently higher than the red line, which is the actual volatility. So traders, um, for example, from JB Morgan, Morgan Stanley, uh, UBS, they actively buy a volatility as to hedge their structure products through, um, you know, through instruments, through positioning, and that allows us to harness this, this heightened volatility and, um, and, and, and express that in terms of our buy and sell targets. You know, for example, if um, we like Origin Energy um, right now because of the uh, shortage in energy and so on, if we like the stock, um, say it's currently trading at $5.75, if we like the stock at $5, we can sell a November $5 put option for around $0.08, cents, you know, targeting an entry price of $4.92. Actually, that's what we did yesterday in this stock. And conversely, if, um, if uh, Woodside uh, is approaching uh, you know, full valuation uh, on Monday, for example, the stock was trading at $36, we sold um, $37.51 euro uh, options in November, and we got $0.78 cents for that. And uh, to add that to the $1.60 dividend as well, you know, we target basically an exit price of nearly $40 on the stock. So you can see that by marrying this volatility in the market each day churning, together with our desired entry and exit prices, we can engineer you know, very, very decent risk reward outcomes. Um, typically, again, we generate between two to 3% in additional premium for every two months, or one to one and a half percent for every month of writing. And this is on top of the portfolio's 4% dividend yield. Um, may we go through a quick three examples in each of the strategies, where the value, uh, events and income to just give you a flavor of what, what we think and how we do it. I think the main difference here is that rather than you know just buying a stock and thinking it's cheap or selling a stock thinking expensive, we do go through the process of thinking in terms of catalyst, you know what's going to drive that value, realization, analysis uh, to, to valuation and then through the actual trade expressioning, whether we do it through stock, options or, or hybrid, and then and the scaling as well. So for example, Brambles, Mark. I'll give you a, pause, a chance to have a pause uh, to answer. Yeah, hi everybody, uh, welcome again to the call. Just I'll take you through some of those examples that Twan's highlighted previously. Brambles is, is a, a clear example in the fund of a, of a relative value uh, addition to the portfolio. We've always liked Brambles. Uh, I, I guess the clear catalyst for um, putting Brambles into the fund or recommending the, the, the stock to Twan back in, in February this year was the, was the fact that they were able to reiterate guidance back in February. So in a world where volatility, as Twan's pointed out, has been elevated and there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, supply chain, input prices and so forth, Brambles as, as a global leader in pallet pooling was able to come out in February and, and reaffirm guidance. They also reaffirmed their commitment to the dividend and the, and the payout ratio, which we thought was very good. What we particularly liked about the story was the fact that they were able to put up prices. You know, in a world where inflation is going up, costs are going up, the, the ability of a company and corporates to put up prices is, is, is quite critical. And Brambles has really illustrated that ability to put up prices and increase their prices across their, uh, their global network, whether that's um, you know, CHIP in the US, uh, chip in EMEA or certainly in the Asia Pacific as well. What's well, been particularly pleasing that the, the, the fund or the stock is still within the portfolio. Um, they, they gave uh, guidance again at the, the four year result back in just August last, that, that the last month that we just had, and it actually put prices up again. So they're continually uh, illustrating the ability to put up prices and recoup some of the rather dramatic cost increases that they're seeing across their business. So we like that. The thesis was validated in some in some way by the fact that they did receive a, a, a sort of a, a, an early takeover proposal by CBC partners um, uh, earlier this year as well, which we thought validated the theory uh, or the thesis to quite uh, a reasonable degree. Interestingly, the, the, the stock is trading well above the price that it traded at, at on the announcement. So the fact that the recent result we've seen was, was a very strong result, uh, profit up 10%, the buyback in place really means EPS grew by more like 20%. Uh, it was a, a very strong result. The, 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 the stock is trading well above where it was on, on, on that announcement. So a very quality, high quality exposure from our point of view. Very cheap, 
uh, I'll let Twan to talk through the uh, the mechanics into yeah. the the, uh, the option. So, yeah, position. when we saw that, I mean, Bramble has been a stable for a long time. In fact, uh, I remember my first trade uh, at uh, 20 years ago at uh, Anton was a Bramble spy ride. <laughs> so nothing changed Something over the last China. 20 years. Yeah. So it's good. Um, but you know, essentially, like Mark said, you know, it's a, it's a great company that is able to pass on the cost right now, able to grow as well, very limited, and good dividend you pay. Um, and it had a buyback as well, as you remember. So uh, on top of buying the stock, we had a three and a half position uh, percent uh, position in the stock. We also take advantage of that buyback and sold nine dollar fifty put. So the stock was around you know nine sixty at the time. Mm -hmm. To um, and it, a buyback typically, what it does is it put an artificial floor, you know, not sort of medium term. It also you know compresses volatility. So we took advantage of that and sold 950 put. As you can see, over the last period, the stock has progressively um, moved upward, and also confirmed by the CVC approach as well. And we do, we do have a roughly thirteen dollar valuation on the stock, so a put at 950 makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So the second example uh, is uh, within the event strategy is Tabcorp. Yeah, so this obviously uh, Tabcorp recently has demerged uh, to the two businesses within the company. We, we, we now have Tabcorp, which is the traditional uh, wa wagering and, and gaming business. And we had the Lotteries business, which is um, split out as a separately listed vehicle uh, known as the, the Lotteries Corporation. Uh, so typically the merger is, is, a, is a great opportunity to realise value or unlock value in a, in a, in a merged entity where the sum of the parts is greater than, than, the, than the trading price at the, at the time as a single entity. We are seeing that at the moment the stock's currently trading, if you put the two back together, it's currently trading around $5, $25.30, which is a reasonable level above where the, the stock as a combined entity was trading prior to the announcement of the, the merger. Now what's interesting about uh, this, the two businesses coming out of, out of, out of the, the merger is on the way during gaming side, so that the, the, the Tabcorp part of the business, or the, the company still known as Tabcorp, that's always been a, a rather unloved child within the, the corporate structure when it was part of the, the, the merged entity. And, and what we've seen with the split is that a real, real refocus on that business from a, a reinvigorated, refreshed, recharged management team. What's been interesting is that we've seen a couple of, of tailwinds move in, in, in favour of Tabcorp. In particular, we're starting to see some talk around tax equalisation across corporate bookmakers, which for a long period of time have actually had um, highly favourable conditions in, in, to their advantage when it comes to tax and so forth, whereas Tabcorp's really been penalised on that side because they've been subject to state regulations, um, you know, gaming and, and racing commission requirements as well. So Queensland's really opened up the Pandora's box in a way by talking about equalising the taxation structure across corporate bookmakers and, and also uh, Tabcorp as the, as the state sanctioned uh, racing body. We should expect to see that across the likes of uh, New South Wales and Victoria as well. And we think that unleashes potentially a significant value release uh, for, for the Tabcorp business. So we like that and really speaks to the, the thesis that we had about the, the merger, the fact that we would have two new businesses or separate businesses, we would have a, a refreshed focus, a renewed focus, a very specific and focused management uh, attention on each of the businesses. And the fact that they could actually pitch the government, for example. So Tabcorp are now in a, a position where they can go to government and say, as a standalone company, this is the sort of changes to the industry that we want to see. Whereas as part of the, the larger business, it was really lost in the detail and, and the focus was more on the on the far more profitable and I guess sexier a lot of these business as well. What we're seeing interestingly enough across both businesses is growth from digital penetration. So the fact that Tabcorp can launch a new app, gaming app, uh, you know, new wagering products, they can also grow online, something that they haven't been doing for quite some time. We're also seeing that on the lottery side, so a very good, long dated, stable, very infrastructure like uh, type business, but also growing digitally as well. So the ability to sell more tickets, uh, lottery ticket sales online and to, and to grow your market presence online is also a very strong option for them as well. And as we say, a put option of 470 made a lot of sense as well. We had a valuation well above five dollars, so mm -hmm. that's that sort of positioning yeah. made a lot of sense at the time. Yeah, so, it's a great event stock mark. I mean, that's why you know. But the, the thing with the merger that it tend to take time. You know, this was announced July last year, so yeah. it took a you know nearly a year worth of uh, approval and so on. And that's why we took the stance that it's going to be a protracted transaction. And that's why we sold four dollar seventy put. Where we're happy to enter the stock. We also saw 525 call against that. So you can see over that period, nearly 11 months to stock, pretty much traded within a 12% range. And, and, and continuously we earn dividend as well as the option premium around that. And now in May, when it emerged now, you know, basically that some of the parts actually break out and a little bit higher than the, um, the, the, the components as well. 
uh, and it also paid six and a half cent dividend. Did, that was nice. just uh, that was very nice. Yeah. And the last uh, example in the income side is Medibank. Yeah, so Medibank, a very good example of a stable, predictable dividend player. So when we think about income, we, we want to own income exposures where we we have a high degree of certainty around the dividend, the sort of dividend that we're going to get, and, and ideally a steadily growing dividend over time. I think Medibank uh, certainly fits that profile. Clearly, tailwinds behind the business in, in, in the sense that private health insurance has become a, a far more uh, considered and valuable proposition for consumers these days. Coming out of COVID, people do realise that, that health and, and the ability to look after your health and provide for your health is, is very important. So there has been a renewed momentum into, into private health insurance after a number of years of decline prior to COVID. Medibank is the, the clean market leader in private health insurance, 27% uh, market share, uh, last we checked, um, and, and the ability to put premium uh, increases through every year, you know, three, four, five percent, three percent most recently, we think is very strong. A relatively capital light business, so when we think about inflation and costing costs and, 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 and those sorts of uh, headwinds across other types of businesses, not as much of a consideration for, for a company like uh, Medibank Private. What we do like is that they're not just thinking about traditional private health insurance and just being your sort of conventional, uh, you know, straight in the uh, in the box private health provider. They are thinking about ancillary services for, for their policy holders, so the, the complementary health services that they're moving into, you know, the programs like Live, Live Better, uh, My Health and so forth are really um, quite successful at, at, at retaining and attracting high value policy holders. So we like the fact that they're playing in the higher end of the market. They are attracting more of that uh, element of the market uh, to the business. And they're really investing back into the policy holder experience. Very well capitalised. So, you know, two years of COVID meant that there weren't many claims on, on in, in the health insurance space. So very well capitalised. They are in fact returning some of that capital back to policy holders, um, not, not just even shareholders, but policy holders. Uh, but a very well uh, positioned business, very well funded, um, and it's clearly meeting a, a very high and acute community yeah. need at the moment as well. So the stock pays 4% uh, fully frank dividend, which is already good in an environment like this, mm -hmm. but the option volatility can add an additional 18% on an annualised basis. So we keep doing this, um, you know, buying the stock and then selling European coal to make sure that we lock in that sort of um, a dividend outcome. So, you know, it has been a very, very good generator consistently of income, not in only in this fund, but also the equity income fund as well. Also also a beneficiary of rising rates in terms of the yes. investment flow as well. So, okay. um, or, or addition, additional to earnings as well, which is helpful. So, um, yeah, so how are we going so far? You know, we've had 50 month track record now, so a little bit over four years. At Macquarie, I had a 100-month track record as well, so together 150 months of, uh, doing the same thing, my God. Um, but uh, essentially, you know, we've been um, very lucky to have um, generated a good return for the last year of 7.4% net uh, before after fees, sorry, after fees and before franking. And you can see that across the time frame, you know, one year, two year, three year, and four years inception, you know, our return has been consistently positive, so we don't swing uh, massively up and, and give it up the next next period. Um, the fund aims to pay most of the total return as income, um, subject to the unit price being you know, at least a dollar for capital stability. So the franking component over the last four years has averaged about 34%, so that's about an additional 1% if you like in terms of uh, income uh, addition. Um, you know, for a national return fund, you know, we're working hard each month is also very critical for us to, to provide this conservative and consistent, consistent outcome, you know, maintaining that capital stability. Um, you can see that uh, our win rate, um, a positive return rate is about 76% uh, with a median return per month of positive 0.8%. You know, like one of our clients commented recently, little by little, but it all adds up. Uh, rather than trying to, you know, break the bank and then smash it next next year, uh, next month or so, um, you know, negative return of more than one percent occur typically, you know, one out of eight months. So, you know, very very important for us that the distribution is highly skewed towards positive. Um, in terms of our universe, um, the chart uh, in the morning stars shows that our relative performance versus the um, our competitors as well as the market for the last two years. And you can see that we have the lowest volatility uh, across the group at 4.6%. And, uh, you know, we generated this in the market, uh, basically the same as the market return for the last two years, with only one third of the volatility. 
So, you know, in summary, you know, we hope that the process and the result continue to show what we do in terms of um, generating returns um, based on different market conditions. And the funds that would combine the IML research uh, with tactical opportunity, like what we're seeing from the fundamentals to the options. And uh, it is able to have three diversified strategies, which is, you know, provided flexibility uh, across the different changing market conditions. The fund is at currently $40 million, so it is quite nimble and flexible to change to um, change to, to different uh, different uh, up and down wings of the market. And, uh, you know, we work hard to provide the stability of cash, but also sufficient but conservative returns from research companies. So thank you, and we would like to welcome questions. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Mark. Um, we do have a, a few questions, and conscious of time, I'm going to compress a few of them into one. Um, one really important one that comes up a bit when we talk to uh, advisors about this fund is uh, from, a, from an advisor, and he asks, in time, could this strategic approach could, be, could it be similar to other income funds that shall sh sell shares to fund the distribution? Um, no, uh, absolutely not. Because uh, again, this is not an income fund. So therefore, you know, when you, for example, put your money in a term deposit, uh, income is only secondary to your capital in the first place. So no, so we will only pay income out of total return generated. Out of, in terms of priority again, capital preservations, total return generation, and then income out of that. Thanks, Tuan. Uh, Mark, one for you. Uh, you touched uh, quickly on REITs uh, as they're seen as a traditionally been seen as a as a good income source. Um, where do you see REITs in this portfolio? Are they are they suited? Well, as Tuan sort of highlights, it's, it's really about being defensive and, and conservative. So we, we do own REITs. I mean, obviously, there's a, a, a fair number of REITs in that office and sort of commercial space, which you would question owning at this point in time, but. The types of REITs we're owning are very much the likes of a, a Waypoint, uh, Dexas Convenience REIT, where it, really the tenants are your, your uh, West Farmers, your Coles, your Audis, your Ampoles, your, your uh, BPs and so forth. So very uh, predictable recurring defensive end tenants and on very long uh, tenancies with typically uh, good CPI inflators attached to those uh, tenancies as well. So paying very good income as Twan highlighted, you know, five to six to seven percent, uh, particularly across those service station rates and convenience rates, uh, and very defensive. So it should hold up much better in, in the sort of market that we're seeing at the moment as opposed to your commercial and office type uh, rates as well. So a role to play for, for, for selective rates in the in the portfolio. Thanks Mark. Um, another one for you, Twan. Um, you mentioned your experience at Macquarie. Um, the question is how does this fund differ from other absolute return funds? Okay, so um, we uh, this fund is built on fundamentals, um, uh, IML, and it doesn't use leverage like typical absolute return fund, you know, 150 long, 150 short, and so on. It has three strategies, um, unlike a typical long short. So long short strategies out there, basically, you know, basically only at one dimension. So we can leverage um, our research together and have an option overlay in terms of income but also uh, harvest the event, corporate events each day as well. So that's that's the idea of it, you know, using a bit of uh, old school intelligence that you understand from the market environment uh, and couple that with the, uh, what, the, what stocks we have followed over, you know, over two decades. So that's that's the difference. Multi-strategy uh, um, with based on fundamentals uh, with option overlay and no gearing. Okay, the last question I'll ask, because I'm very conscious of time, I'm gonna combine a few into this one. Um, the questions around volatility currently and, and, and how you position, but but also um, which is quite an interesting way of coming at it. The questioner asks your mindset when faced with a with a with a lead of a down market into the into Australia from the US. What's your mindset when you approach the day? So first, um, typically I panic first and then do a bit of praying for risk management, and then I go through and think about you know uh, what you know basically you know as I'm in. in a unit holder in the fund itself, so you know we have to protect our capital. So that's sort of um, you know some some for some managers in a downturn like that to say you know oh my high conviction stock let's load up more let's buy more you know the market's wrong I'm right and so on. We think in terms of you know how first of all our capital you know we go through come through all the positions we have and, and basically ask you know is this the right position in this current market environment? If it's not, then we'll cut and focus on you know the base stock that. Is going to do well in this market condition. Uh, we're going to bring all the un unnecessary sort of risk levels inwards 
and we also always maintain that sort of um, exposure, as I mentioned before, net exposure, to make sure that the fund can cope with um, you know unexpected surprises. Uh, obviously, um, in the end, you know it's not about a fund that is pride itself on ego or, or you know trying to leverage into the performance phase. First and foremost, we have to think of terms of our, our clients' sort of capital, and then eke out that return and make sure that we what we have uh, is appropriate for the current environment. Thanks, Tuan. Um, look, and that's why we think at IML that this fund is very well suited to the current environment. I mean, we talk to a lot of planners um, about income and around capital civility, and, and markets have been volatile after a, a, a number of years of, of momentum-driven returns. We think this fund fits a very, very nice piece of a portfolio for investors that, that are looking for a, a, a more uh, even and non-volatile ride. Look, that concludes the update for today. Thank you very much for joining us to uh, to hear our story. Um, for the few questions that I have here that we haven't gotten to um, in, in the interest of time, we will come back to you with answers on that. And also, please reach out if there's if there's things in there that, that, that particularly are of interest. We're very happy to, uh, to go over those a little bit further. Um, the one thing that we probably did miss was that Zenith also has this fund as a recommended and it's included in some of the Zenith portfolios. Happy to talk to you about that. But uh, in conscious of your time, thank you very much for joining us um, and have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.